The following recorded program is part of the Mount Sinai Medical Center Lecture Series, offered by Mount Sinai Medical Center in cooperation with the City of Sunny Isles Beach. So I'm going to be talking to you uh, today. My focus is actually going to be on how we use different forms of brain imaging to diagnose uh, Alzheimer's disease and also other forms of dementia and also to see how the brain imaging can help us monitor uh, what's happening in an, indiv in, uh, in an individual and how we use it to uh, assess the response to treatment, uh, especially in, um, in research. Uh, as we're testing new drugs, uh, the use of brain imaging can be very helpful in determining whether um, the treatment is, is affecting the brain in, the, in a significant way and in the appropriate way. So you see uh, the images of the brain on the two slides there. Uh, um, the, the brain is uh, a highly specialized organ and every single part of the brain has uh, its own independent function, uh, which is unique for any organ in the body. Um, you know, if you look at the liver, the heart, the kidney, uh, any of the organs, uh, any part of that organ uh, behaves exactly like any other part of that organ, okay? But that's not the case for the brain. Every single region of the brain has its own special function. And uh, they're identified by the different colors there and numbers, which you probably may, may not be able to make out properly. They're called Broadman numbers. So uh, that's the first thing. Um, and then it's not just the individual regions that are important, but how they're all connected together. So there are different systems in the brain. Um, and the one that is being portrayed here in the, in the pictures here in the slide um, is called the limbic system. The limbic system is very involved with memory. And it starts uh, with uh, a region in the brain called the hippocampus. It's that blue area. You see that uh, um, <clears throat> C-shaped structure uh, with a little bulge at the, at the bottom, deep blue. And then it's, it's connected by a circuit, which is known as the Papus circuit, P-A-P-E-Z, to uh, different uh, parts of the brain and then to uh, the, the gray matter of the cortex of the brain. And so when memories are uh, formed, they first have to channel through that hippocampus and then they get distributed to various parts of the brain. So this hippocampus works a bit like a post office. Uh, you get all the uh, messages coming in and then the messages are delivered to various addresses uh, based on what kind of information is in those messages. And the hippocampus is also involved in retrieving that information when you need to uh, retrieve that. Um, if you're trying to remember something, it knows where that information is stored uh, because it delivered it there for th in the first place and then it brings it back. And that's how memory works. Um, now, the important thing to remember about the hippocampus is that it is a structure that uh, is involved with acquiring new information, new learning. Now, information that has already been learned um, is not, uh, can, can be retrieved by the hippocampus, but the main function of the hippocampus is to acquire new information. So when you have a problem with the hippocampus, when it starts degenerating for some reason, or if you have a stroke in that region, or some other 
type of damage to that, that structure. What really happens is that you cannot, uh, you cannot recall anything uh, that has been recently acquired, but you can still require a lot of acquire a lot of information that's from the past. And the symptom that is typical for people who have damage to the hippocampus is that they have difficulty um, remembering recent events, recently acquired, recently learned events. Uh, which is one of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, the most prominent symptom of Alzheimer's disease is uh, changes in recent memory, which is why people with Alzheimer's disease have difficulty uh, recalling recent events and often repeat themselves because uh, they don't remember what they've just said. Uh, or if they ask a question, they don't remember what the answer to the question was, so they ask the question over and over again. Uh, so those are some of the features that come out because of the particular function of the hippocampus. And why is the hippocampus so important in Alzheimer's disease? Well, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, um, there are certain parts of the brain that are particularly vulnerable to the uh, pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And the limbic system is, and the hippocampus in particular, is, uh, is very uh, susceptible to that kind of damage. And so that's why you get memory problems very, very early. There's a structure which is very close to the hippocampus called the amygdala. The amygdala is very much involved with uh, emotional memory uh, and emotions uh, in general. And uh, that area is also part of the limbic system and it gets affected uh, and is also susceptible to the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So another thing that happens to people who have, uh, who develop Alzheimer's disease is that they, um, they have damage to their uh, control of emotions because the amygdala is affected. And as a result, people with Alzheimer's disease will not only have problems with their memory, but they can become irritable, uh, they can become depressed, they can become anxious, uh, and they can become paranoid. They develop delusions. They're very susceptible to um, problems when an individual, for example, um, uh, you know, they can't find something. So, you know, they, they don't remember where they put something. <clears throat> when they can't find something, <clears throat> excuse me. They, <coughs> excuse me. They, <coughs> they may have difficulty with uh, um, <clears throat> recalling where they've, they've put something, and when they can't find something, they uh, imagine that somebody has stolen what they, uh, what they can't find. They become paranoid, and they accuse people of stealing. So, you know, uh, many of my patients have uh, fired their housekeepers because they suspect their housekeepers of stealing things that uh, they can't find, which they've sort of hidden away. Uh, in secret places. So, okay, uh, that's sort of an introduction to, you know, the areas of the brain that are particularly affected in, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I mentioned that there are different systems in the brain. Um, <clears throat> another system is uh, completely different from the limbic system, which is involved with memory. And there's a system called <clears throat> the nigrostriatal system which, <coughs> excuse me, is affected in Parkinson's disease. Uh, I'm not going to be talking much about that, but I just wanted to point, it that, point that out. Uh, it is pretty close to the limbic system, and <coughs> people who have Alzheimer's disease can ultimately develop problems with movement as well. It's not an early symptom, but movement becomes an issue uh, often in the moderate to later stages of the disease. So balance, movement, slowness of movements, uh, stiffness of their muscles, um, tremors. Uh, so basically, m the motor system of the brain gets, uh, gets affected. 
<coughs> so <coughs> what you have here in the two slides um, <coughs> are uh, the two pathological features of, of Alzheimer's disease. One is um, <coughs> the um, amyloid plaques, which is on the top, and uh, on the bottom are the tangles, which are inside nerve cells. And um, those two structures <coughs> have two different proteins that are involved uh, that um, <coughs> form those structures. The top one, the amyloid plaque, uh, let me show you this in, in somewhat more detail and in color. So what you see there uh, is a brown area in the center, um, and all that brown color there is the amyloid, which is uh, part of the, um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's part of what's called the amyloid plaque. And the amyloid is thought to be the first problem that occurs in Alzheimer's disease. This is the deposition of this protein that then um, causes a change in the, uh, the environment around it so that the nerve cells start getting affected and they start dying. And the black structure that you see that looks like a flask uh, that's actually a nerve cell, and all the black inside it are the tangles. The tangles are um, the uh, are, are proteins called tau protein that uh, become twisted, and that's why they're called tangles. And they're part of the transport system inside the, the nerve cell, and when the system gets affected this way, when it when these filaments become tangled, they, uh, they cause a, a loss of the function of the nerve cell and ultimately the nerve cell dies, uh, which is why then there is problems with um, the different functions that that nerve cell performs, such as, in this case, memory. So, uh, <clears throat> So the two proteins <coughs> that um, I've been uh, me, talking about are the, the amyloid protein and the tau protein. And uh, we have learned now that the amyloid protein probably is deposited well before the tau protein. It causes a, a series of changes that results in the tau, it's only when the tau protein starts becoming affected that the changes occur uh, with regard to memory. The amyloid is deposited something like 20 years before the tau protein actually starts getting uh, damaged and causes the problems of the function in the nerve cell. Uh, as a result of the changes in the, in the nerve cells, there is uh, the death of the nerve cells and of the white matter in the brain itself, and the brain starts to shrink. So what you see here are two autopsy brains that have been sliced, and uh, on the left side, you see uh, a, uh, a normal brain, a person that does not have Alzheimer's disease, and on the right, you see somebody that, has, uh, that had Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of shrinkage of the brain, which is a result of the, uh, the damage to, to the nerve cells and the loss not only of the gray matter of the brain, but also of the white matter of the brain. And those dark spaces in the center you, that you see in the right image are uh, fluid-filled spaces that enlarge because as the brain shrinks, something has to take its place. And uh, that's all fluid that takes the place of the shrinking brain. And we can see this in brain images. So here's an MRI scan of the brain. This is a normal individual. There's no, no trace of Alzheimer's disease. The circle um, that is colored red uh, is outlining the hippocampus the seat of, of memory in the brain. 
And uh, then the structures next to it are also very much involved with the limbic system, the memory system of the brain. So all those structures uh, can be measured in their volume and visually we can tell when we look at these MRI images, we can tell whether they're normal or not. And this is a very helpful diagnostic uh, test for us so that we can tell whether the hippocampus looks completely normal in its size or whether it's shrinking and how much it's shrinking also those uh, surrounding structures. Now here you see um, four different images. Uh, on the top left is uh, the normal brain. Uh, looks, uh, there's no sh not much shrinkage or very little. And then on the bottom right you see the most, uh, uh, somebody who has uh, well advanced Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the hippocampus uh, is now shrunken um, and there is a lot of fluid taking its place. It's that black area around the hippocampus, which you can probably see, the right bottom. And the, there are in between uh, two other slices there of people who have mild cognitive impairment uh, in different stages. So there's progressive Im impairment from the uh, top left to the bottom right. And this is just an example of how we use the MRI scan to tell us whether an individual has the structural changes that are present in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and it's very useful as a diagnostic test. In the very early stages though, uh, when there's only amyloid deposits in the brain, you may not see the, 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 the shrinkage of the brain. Um, as I said earlier on, the amyloid is actually deposited like 20 years before the uh, shrinkage of the brain starts, the tau protein starts getting affected. So we don't see that uh, right away, uh, the shrinkage. The amyloid though is there and one other way we might be able to test for uh, what's going on in the brain is just if is to try to visualize the presence of amyloid protein in the brain. So uh, this is just uh, another scan here now uh, called a PET scan. But this scan does not, uh, is not designed to, um, uh, show, to visualize the amyloid in the brain. This scan is measuring how much glucose there is that is used by the brain. Uh, so it's a glucose PET scan. And why do we use glucose in this way? Well, the brain uses glucose as its source of energy. Um, and so when the brain functions, it, it sort of consumes a lot of glucose. And we can label the glucose uh, in the brain uh, using this, this PET scan. And when there are uh, abnormalities, it shows up right away. So it's more sensitive than the MRI scan. So in many cases when we can't see the shrinkage that is occurring in the brain, but we suspect that something's going wrong um, in the functioning of the brain, we can use the, uh, this type of PET scan, the glucose PET scan, to tell us uh, what, whether there is some kind of damage or not. And in this particular case, you see on the left side a normal brain using the normal amount of glucose. All that red area is high glucose use, which is normal. Uh, on the right side, you see a lot of areas that uh, are yellow, uh, and those are the abnorm abnormally affected areas of the brain. Uh, and this person does not have any shrinkage on the MRI scan, but the PET scan is showing up the abnormalities. This is a more severe case of Alzheimer's disease with this glucose PET scan. Uh, on the left is a relatively normal brain, and on the right, all that blue area is very low glucose use, 
which uh, sort of brings out the, the damage that has occurred. All right. <clears throat> now, we have in the last 10 years been able to uh, visualize the presence of amyloid in the brain as well. And so this is, um, the amyloid is around the brain cells and we've been able to, just as we're able to visualize the glucose, we have now found a way to, uh, to label the amyloid using uh, the, the PET scan technique. And uh, what you see here is an amyloid PET scan with uh, a lot of amyloid in the brain. Um, so we can now use this amyloid PET scan to uh, determine whether an individual has the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease because the amyloid is present and yet all the other tests are normal, including the glucose PET scan and the MRI scan. And we feel that this is the stage of the disease that will be most susceptible to treatment because there hasn't been too much damage yet. As we get more into the, you know, it's just like any other disease of the body, the earlier you detect it and the earlier you can intervene with whatever medications are available, the more uh, effective you can be in your, in your treatment. So as a result, if we can detect it in the amyloid stage, in the only, when it's only amyloid protein in the brain and nothing else, we can then uh, uh, perhaps be much more successful. If, particularly if we are able to determine ways in which we can remove amyloid protein from the brain. So that's the big effort that is being undertaken right now. Um, <clears throat> So in, in this particular set of images, uh, you have a, a glucose PET scan and an amyloid PET scan on the right, um, and they're all uh, showing you uh, abnormalities. The glucose PET scan in this case is abnormal, and the amyloid PET scan is abnormal as well. And most recently, in the last five years, we have been able to label the tau protein as well. So the tau protein is the most specific for Alzheimer's disease. If you have both amyloid and the tau protein, you know that you're dealing with, uh, with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we, we don't have a way right now for paying for the, um, uh, the, the tau PET scans are still a, a, in an experimental stage, but we are doing a lot of studies right now uh, in which we are beginning to use the tau PET scan for research to evaluate how they can tell us about how treatment is, um, whether or not treatment is successful. Similarly, we're using that with the amyloid PET scans as well. Um, <clears throat> now, we can use the MRI scans to, uh, <clears throat> in this case, um, and the CAT scans to tell us about other pathologies that can mimic uh, Alzheimer's disease. So here you see some examples of different uh, conditions that can be misdiagnosed as, as Alzheimer's disease, but in fact require a completely different approach to treatment in our different conditions. So on the left is an individual who has a brain tumor, the MRI scan that large white structure in, in the middle of the brain is, is, a, is a brain tumor. Uh, it's a glioma and uh, it's in the frontal lobe and it can produce symptoms of memory loss and a lot of the behavior changes that are very typical uh, that, you know, in, th in this particular individual, the person was diagnosed to have Alzheimer's disease, but once they had the MRI scan, it became quite evident that they had a completely different condition which required a different approach to treatment. The other individual in the middle uh, has a blood clot. Uh, it's called a subdural hematoma. The individual had had a knock to the head um, and over a period of about uh, a month or so, 
gradually started developing memory problems, become, became lethargic, and uh, was diagnosed initially or thought to have Alzheimer's disease. However, when they had the scan done, that large, you see the arrows there pointing to the, the presence of the blood, which is in between the skull and the brain itself. Uh, it's called a subdural hematoma. So it's causing a lot of pressure on the brain and affecting the function of the brain. But the symptoms that the person had were basically those of loss of memory and uh, overall lethargy. And once the um, neurosurgeon put in a little burr hole and drained the fluid out, uh, patient became normal again. So this is a reversible type of condition uh, that can be detected. Uh, on the right is an individual who's had uh, multiple strokes of the brain, also presented as though they had uh, Alzheimer's disease, memory problems, but in fact had numerous strokes. This individual was found to have um, a condition called atrial fibrillation, uh, which uh, uh, is an irregular heartbeat, and it causes some blood clots to form inside the, in the heart, which then can break off uh, and then go to the brain. So this was the first indication that this individual actually had atrial fibrillation and was, um, you know, sending blood clots off from the heart to cause these little strokes that caused symptoms that were very similar to to Alzheimer's disease. So uh, again, the, the brain scan was very helpful in uh, detecting the underlying cause of this individual's symptoms, which were not actually caused by Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are other conditions that can be detected by the brain scans. Uh, this is a condition that uh, is also a degenerative brain disease like Alzheimer's disease. It uh, is called frontotemporal dementia. Uh, that's because it's, it affects uh, parts of the brain that are typically not affected in Alzheimer's disease, mainly the frontal lobes and the, the uh, most anterior part of the front of the temporal lobes. Uh, and in this case, the MRI scan as well as the PET scan uh, very clearly detects the pattern of, uh, of shrinkage of the brain and the change in the uh, glucose use on the uh, glucose PET scan on the right that is typical for frontotemporal dementia. Um, again, another way in which we use these scans to determine what the underlying cause of the problem was. Now, this is unfortunately not a condition that can be treated like the other ones that I showed you. But um, it does help us to determine what the underlying condition is and what the treatment could be if we have effective treatments. Uh, this particular condition, the frontotemporal dementia actually, is a problem which does not involve amyloid, so they don't have amyloid in the brain, but they have a lot of the tau protein in the brain. So it's one of those conditions where the tau scan would be particularly helpful in telling us exactly uh, what the problem is and in detecting it at the earliest possible stage. Uh, and then there are individuals who have Parkinson's disease who can develop a condition called uh, Lewy body dementia, which you may or may not have heard of. Uh, Lewy body dementia is a condition that causes memory problems. Um, but also causes changes that are typical of Parkinson's. And they often have some certain psychiatric problems that are quite prominent, such as hallucinations, visual hallucinations. They see people or uh, objects um, that are not there. They have hallucinations. Um, and they can have a problem with sleep, in particular, uh, nightmares. Um, so those are the typical features of Lewy body dementia. And um, we can detect uh, the presence of 
the abnormal. So that, that first slide that I showed you of the, the system that is involved in Parkinson's disease, we can visualize that with a different kind of PET scan. Uh, it's a PET scan that uh, shows us how much dopamine the brain is using. Uh, dopamine is the chemical that is involved with uh, movement in the brain. And that particular chemical is uh, highly involved with uh, dopamine, uh, is used in Parkinson's disease to treat Parkinson's disease because they have a deficiency of, of dopamine in the brain. So um, in, in this particular individual, uh, the, the two top slides are the normal uh, brain. The center area is the area in the brain that is the seat of dopamine. It's called the substantia nigra. And the two bottoms show you a uh, much reduced amount of dopamine in the brain. So we can use this type of PET scan to tell us about uh, the presence of uh, Parkinson-like symptoms or basically the deficiency of dopamine in the brain and uh, what kind of treatment that individual would, would require. Um, and this is uh, yet another example of uh, frontotemporal, excuse me, of vascular dementia. So uh, I'm going to uh, end with this. Uh, I know that many of you have different questions probably related to uh, topics that I didn't quite cover here but are related to either diagnosis or treatment of Alzheimer's disease or symptoms. So I'm going to open up the, uh, uh, the field for, for, for questions now. Um, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you for coming today. I wanted to ask you about the drug Aricept and uh, ask your opinion if you think that it's helpful or not really. Okay, I hope you all heard the question. It was about the use of Aricept for uh, treating Alzheimer's disease and whether it's helpful. Well, um, Aricept is one of a class of medications uh, that include uh, Exelon, patch and uh, galantamine. They all belong to the same class. They, um, they, uh, they increase the amount of a particular chemical in the brain called acetylcholine. And the acetylcholine is very important in that limbic system that I pointed out earlier. Um, it, it is involved as a chemical messenger that transmits the, uh, the, the messages related to memory from the limbic system to the rest of the brain. In Alzheimer's disease, there's a deficiency of uh, this, this particular chemical, acetylcholine. And uh, a drug like Aricept uh, basically boosts the amount of acetylcholine inside the brain. Uh, just like um, in Parkinson's disease, the use of dopamine boosts the amount of dopamine that's available in the brain. So two are similar. Uh, it does not treat the actual underlying cause of the disease, but it improves symptoms. So it's like treating a headache with Tylenol uh, when you want to relieve an individual's symptoms. Uh, now the headache may be caused by just tension and uh, something that just goes away, or it might be caused by a brain tumor. So the Tylenol is not going to be able to treat the brain tumor, but it may still relieve the symptoms. Essentially, this is what we're doing here with uh, treating um, Alzheimer's disease with uh, Aricept, uh, where it's a symptomatic treatment. Does that answer it? Yes. What is the state of cure? What's the stage of cure? Okay. Uh, uh, well, um, very <laughs> incisive question. Uh, something that's not easy to answer. 
because we don't really have um, a cure uh, or anything that is yet close to a cure. Uh, but we do have some emerging signs that we might be uh, going in the right path right now. So there are different approaches to, to treating Alzheimer's disease to, in, in what we call a disease-modifying uh, method of treatment. So when you use the word cure, it might be a little bit more optimistic than uh, what we can really uh, manage to do. Um, I think what we can do is we can find different mechanisms that are involved in the pathology of the disease, such as we know that amyloid is a major part of the initiation of the disease. So uh, if we can approach the disease very early, um, remove amyloid from the brain, then we might have a chance in preventing the uh, onset of the disease into what we call the clinical phase, where the memory starts getting affected. So we have to be able to detect the uh, presence of the amyloid in what we call the preclinical stage of the disease, that is, before there, is, there are any symptoms. And uh, so when we look at the amyloid PET scans that I showed you, if we could afford to do those scans at a very early uh, stage, like you have a colonoscopy, for example, Everybody is supposed to have a colonoscopy at least once after the age of 50 um, to uh, detect the possibility that they, are, they actually have colon cancer or they're a candidate for developing colon cancer. So similarly, uh, you know, we could possibly have that as a, a way of looking at individuals, screening them for the presence of amyloid. Maybe not at 50, maybe at 65 or something like that. Um, but then having successful methods of removing the amyloid. Now we are getting pretty close to that, to, to getting to removing amyloid. But if that is successful, it's going to be um, uh, prevention really. It's trying to uh, detect people who are uh, candidates for developing Alzheimer's disease before they develop the disease and detecting it at that stage and treating them uh, adequately. So that's one approach. Um, for people who already have the symptoms of the disease, um, the, um, there are methods that basically that are uh, focusing on the tau treatment, uh, trying to remove the tau abnormalities from the brain, the, uh, the damaged tau protein, um, and preventing it from spreading so in Alzheimer's disease, the tau protein uh, is actually, uh, again, in that, those areas of the brain, the hippocampus, that are most susceptible to it, those areas get affected first. But it then spreads from those areas to other parts of the brain. If we can stop the spread at that point, we can then prevent the progression. So that's the, an another way. So there are drugs now being developed to try to prevent tau protein from spreading, not necessarily from, uh, you know, uh, being deposited initially, but having the symptoms already preventing it from spreading so that you can keep it at one particular stage. So ultimately, I think what we're going to do is we're going to have, like as we do for cancer, we're going to have a cocktail of treatments, you know, or for treating uh, HIV infections, just one one antibiotic or one antiviral agent doesn't do it. A uh, person becomes resistant to one agent, so you're going to need a sort of a way of uh, d developing different approaches, all focused on the disease uh, to treat the disease. And we do that for cancer now routinely. We know that just using one treat, one drug is often insufficient. And we've been very successful actually with, with cancer treatment. Uh, you know, the journey is really just beginning now for Alzheimer's disease in, in that particular approach. So I, th I think we're going to use treatments like Aricept uh, that are used for uh, symptomatic treatments combined with 
treatments for amyloid and for tau all together. And there's another pathology that occurs in the brain in addition to all that, which is that the immune system of the brain aggravates everything that amyloid and tau abnormalities do to the brain. So the, the immune system gets triggered uh, when the amyloid is deposited. If we can shut down that process of the immune activation in the brain, uh, a completely different approach from treating the amyloid and the tau, again, we can perhaps reduce the impact of the disease uh, on symptoms and progression of the disease. So it might require, again, in including amyloid, tau, the chemical messengers, and the immune system as well. Yes? I'm thinking of testing for the gene that, that could give me a probability of having Alzheimer's in the future. Today, is there something that can be done if I'm positive? Because uh, I listen that you, you are saying, we are going to have this in the future, we are going to have that. But today, is there something that can be done for prevention? Um, so I, I think that there are, there are two parts to your question. One is, can you detect it right now with uh, a, a genetic test? And then, uh, then perhaps... If it's positive, yeah. it's Right. So th there are, uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a gene called APOE, uh, which you may or may not have heard of. Uh, the APOE gene has got three different forms. Uh, there's the E2, E3, and E4. If you have E4, it increases your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. If you have E3, it's a neutral risk. If you have E2, you have a reduced risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So detecting the E4 gene is um, one way in which we can um, determine whether an individual is susceptible for developing the disease. It doesn't mean that if you have the E4 gene, you're going to develop it, the Alzheimer's disease. It just means that your risk is, is higher. And um, so, but it's not by itself. Um, um, it's, it basically is a, is a gene that um, uh, is involved with amyloid in the brain. So people who have the E4 tend to have a lot more amyloid in the brain. And that's how it works. Uh, so if you have E4, the next stage would be to do an amyloid PET scan to see whether you're positive for, for amyloid. Unfortunately, the insurance companies now do not pay for uh, amyloid PET scans. They will pay for the E4 test, the E4 gene test, but they won't pay for the amyloid PET scan. We think that, you know, in the next two or three years, the insurance companies will uh, start covering, um, Medicare, for example, may start covering the amyloid PET scans. But right now, it costs about $5,000 to, to get that PET scan. So. It's not, it, it, you can get it, it's available, but uh, you have to pay for it. So uh, that's basically the, the only thing we can do. Now, there are other genes that have a much smaller effect in increasing your risk for Alzheimer's disease, uh, what we call the late onset form of Alzheimer's disease, um, which is the most, most common, like 95% of all, all cases of Alzheimer's disease are late onset Alzheimer's disease. They tend to occur after the age of 65. Um, those, those forms of uh, Alzheimer's disease, the late onset, the risk factor for that uh, includes the E4 gene, but also uh, to a much lesser extent, many other, we've now detected about 30 other genes that are involved. And when you sum them together, we call that a polygenic risk score. You can include the APOE to that. You basically double your ability to predict uh, the risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So that's something else that we can start using at some point. Again, that, that polygenic risk score is not covered by insurance companies. Only the APOE is right now. Okay, yes. So, 
Well, yes, that, that's, that's important. Uh, so there are lots of things that you can do that can sort of reduce your risk for developing the disease. And those, uh, those measures are basically uh, what we call uh, lifestyle measures, okay? That they're exercise, diet, and a lot of cognitive stimulation and social stimulation. So everything that's good for the heart is good for the brain. Um, the amount of exercise you do is crucial, perhaps the most important of all of those. Um, but also the cognitive stimulation, the diet, uh, healthy, uh, heart healthy diet, and, uh, and a lot of cognitive activities. Does it answer it? Okay. Yes. That was the question. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Oh. Yes. Now, uh, after this, I, I'd just like to let you know uh, some of the uh, studies that we are uh, going to be doing or are currently doing right now. And uh, I'd like to actually, after this question, ask Raquel and perhaps Carolina to come up here and tell you about some of the uh, research that we're doing. Not yet, Raquel. <laughs> um, and I also want to tell you about other research pro pro projects that we are actually recruiting people for right now. Yes. Uh, my question is on the amyloid scans that you have uh, done so far. <coughs> what is the percentage of positive? I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, on the uh, amyloid scans that have been done, what is the uh, percentage of positive scans that you have found in your research? So how, what percentage of individuals are, uh, are positive for the amyloid yes. that, uh, in, in our studies that we've done? Yeah, we've done um, uh, about uh, 250 amyloid PET scans so far as part of our research study, which uh, Raquel is going to tell you a little bit about uh, right now. Um, and uh, I'd say about 30% are amyloid positive. Um, the, the, it's related also in part to your age. The older you are, the greater your risk. Uh, the more impairment you have in your memory, the more likely you are to be positive for uh, the amyloid PET scan. And of course, if you have the E4 gene that I mentioned, uh, you're much more likely to be positive. Um, so we are, um, we have been for the last uh, three and a half years um, doing the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center study. It's called the ADRC. We recruit people above the age of 60, sometimes a little bit younger depending on uh, circumstances. Uh, and it's a five-year commitment to, it's an observational study, so we're trying to uh, determine what the natural course of normal aging is and abnormal aging is uh, related to Alzheimer's disease. So we do uh, um, detailed neuropsychological tests. We do the MRI scan that you saw. We do the amyloid PET scan. And we do annual follow-ups. Um, we are very, very interested in, you know, following people up for as long as possible. So e even though it's a five-year commitment, we'd like to be able to follow people up for 10 or 15 years as well, okay? We, it's a study which is funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, and we are one of uh, 30 different centers in the country that are all doing basically the same thing. Our focus in, in this particular center is most centers don't have the amyloid PET scans as part of their program. They occasionally do the amyloid PET scans, but in our study, the amyloid PET scan is part of the, of the program, so that's a big part of what we do. The other thing that we're doing here, because of the demographics of our uh, population, we're looking at how um, Alzheimer's disease 
uh, especially in its earliest stages, is manifest in different ethnic groups, especially in Hispanics versus non-Hispanics, and we are now going on to looking at African Americans as well in more detail. But uh, so that's another big focus of, of what we're doing. So I'm just going to ask uh, Raquel to give you a short spiel on what she's, what she would like you to know about the program. About the ADRC? Yeah, about the ADRC, yeah. Hi, my name is Raquel and I'm the study coordinator for One Florida ADRC. So it's a five-year observational study. Um, each participant requires a study partner. It would be someone who knows you pretty well. It could be a spouse, maybe one of your kids, a close friend who can vouch for you and um, be interviewed every year. So every year you would get a phone call from me coming in um, to do memory testing for the bulk of the day and then uh, followed by a neurological interview. It would be like a physical and an interview. And then after that, within your first year, you're required to have a brain MRI and an amyloid PET scan, which I would be setting up for you. And we will be paying each participant $70 for each visit. So it'd be $70 for um, the first three visits and then following every single year. So a lot of people like to join the study because um, we take care of everything for you, and then you know we uh, you don't have to worry about insurance, you don't have to worry about paying for anything, and on top of it, um, you'll get phone calls from me setting up all the your appointments, making it a lot easier for you. And on top of that, we also have other studies available at the Wien Center. We have we are doing Mindsight, which is what which you would also need a partner for, and it's a 10-week program to help improve your memory. You would be coming to Mount Sinai every week for about an hour, and in the first week and in the last week, you will be tested on your memory to see if there was improvements. Um, in addition, we also have clinical trials where we would be testing the efficacy of medications, uh, different medications that would help uh, dementia, um, and also we have Generations, which is going to be a, a genetic study where we would be swabbing you. Talk about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Dar is going to talk about it right now. So okay. if you have any questions or if you're interested in learning more about the Wien Center or any of the studies that we have to offer, I'll be right in the back and please feel free to call me, leave a message. I always try to get back to everyone the same day or the next day and I'd be happy to guide you. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to expand a little bit on the um, on some of the other st studies that we're doing. So, uh, we're doing uh, studies on uh, detecting. You know, you talked to a lady at the back asked about uh, early detection, uh, the genetic test. So, we have two studies that are involved with uh, treating individuals with a drug which is designed to uh, remove um, uh, amyloid from the brain uh, in people who are uh, E4 positive. So, um, so the first thing we do is we do a swab of your um, uh, a saliva swab, and we can use the saliva to detect the E4 gene. Um, so if you're E4 positive, um, we can then uh, schedule you to have the amyloid PET scan, and with the once if you are positive for the amyloid PET scan, then you are eligible to take part in a study. So anybody that is interested above the age of 60 um, that's interested in participating in, in this study, we'd be very happy to uh, to have you uh, involved. Um, we. Uh, you need to be cognitively normal, so we do a neuropsychological battery of tests that takes about uh, an hour and a half, and we determine that there are no memory deficits uh, because this is, again, a prevention study. Um, we are also engaged in the, the MindSight study, which uh, Raquel uh, mentioned, now this is a six week trial and it's a combination of trying to uh, reduce stress as well as 
improve, uh, uh, learn techniques to improve your, your memory. It requires an individual who has some memory problems, what we call mild cognitive impairment. So we have to make a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. But uh, you are then el eligible to take part in the study as long as you have a partner who can come with you f once a week for six weeks. Um, and we do a psychological tests, cognitive tests before the program, the six-week program, and after the six-week program to see what the impact is. The idea of having the partner in this program is to uh, um, have someone who can uh, uh, assist the individual with the memory problem to um, continue uh, the, uh, to keep going through the exercises that, that are taught during the actual program. So during the six-week program, there's a one-hour set of exercises that the individual goes through to learn how to, to learn strategies to improve their memory and their ability to use language, uh, you know, remember names and uh, directions easily. Uh, the partner uh, learns these strategies as well and reinforces them throughout the rest of the week. And so that's the reason for having the partner. This program is called the Mind Sight Program. And uh, we've been doing this now for the last six months and we hope that uh, this is something that we will continue to be able to do in the future. So um, just to let you know, Spread the word if you or, or anybody else uh, know of someone who could be eligible. Any other questions about any of these studies? We have time for one more question, and then um, we're going to wrap it up. And then uh, whoever has individual questions that want to ask Dr. Duara or Raquel, they're going to stay here for a few more minutes afterwards to do one-on-one. -on -one. Any other group questions? Oh, yes, I just want to know what's the difference in treatment between dementia, vascular dementia and Alzheimer? Is it the same illness or is it different? Uh, very good question. Um, so vascular dementia uh, really requires a different approach. Uh, if it's pure vascular dementia, the, what I didn't really state uh, very clearly, I think, uh, during my talk was that Vascular dementia is very rarely a sort of, uh, it's, it's a pure, pure condition. Most often it is mixed with Alzheimer's disease. So as a result, we, we really treat um, uh, Alzheimer's disease in most people who have vascular dementia with whatever methods we have available. But if they do have the vascular uh, risk factors that uh, are evident on, say, the MRI scan, uh, we look for all the other risk factors for vascular disease that can aggravate the problem then on. So managing their blood pressure in particular is very important if they have atrial fibrillation, making sure that they have their own anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents. And um, um, of course, all the other measures that are good for reducing vascular risk factors such as managing cholesterol, exercise, which we are recommending anyway for people who have Alzheimer's disease. We emphasize it in particular for people who have vascular disease uh, and diet, uh, which again is something that we do for both. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. Yeah. Well, perfect. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And then we're going to wrap it up here. And now it's just going to be individual questions. Have a great day. Happy New Year. And we'll see you guys in January. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.